I am angry at the injustice of the food system. I am. I'm angry about it, actually. I think it's outrageous. It offends me morally. Uh, personally, I'm not a very angry person. Um, or I hope I'm not. Uh, of course, like everyone, I've been angry in my life. Usually I regret it. But I'm angry, I'm angry about the food system. The food system could be so good, and uh, we've gone wrong. It's a we. I don't blame it, it's we. I'm it. Uh, and I get out of bed in the morning to do my bit to try and help. But, uh, I think we are now facing a very interesting period in food, which is where I'm not angry, I'm optimistic, which is I think enough people know what's wrong and we've got enough insight into what could be done better and how to do it. There are challenges but we know enough uh, and I'm sensing an optimism there. Although the world is very strange, it's uncertain, prices are volatile, things are bad in one respect, indicators are bad, but actually uh, in, in crisis is when the food system has been improved. Historically, that's a general rule. So I'm an optimist. We're in a slow car crash of a food crisis. And I think in that, people from within the food economy, within food supply chains, within civil society, ordinary consumers, not enough policy makers, not enough politicians, but a few, there's beginnings to be the beginnings of a consensus emerging. We can't go on like this. A different model of food progress is chartable and also doable. That's why I'm an optimist. So I'm post-angry. I think we know in the rich world that we've got to lower our footprint, lower our impact, eat less, eat more simply, eat more diversely. That we know. In the poor world, it's a totally different picture. They've got to eat more. They need more range, more food, more quantity, more infrastructure. So we've got very different messages, directions, uh, according to who the we is. We here in Stockholm, we in London, that's a different world to Bangladesh or Malawi. Totally. It's a different planet, metaphorically. So the, who's the we is the important issue. But there are some commonalities across those very divided worlds. One is more equal societies are better societies. More equal food systems feed people better. If as the great Amartya Sen showed decades ago, got the Nobel Prize for it. Uh, if people feel they haven't got an entitlement to eat, they won't be angry and campaign for food when they're hungry. We're now in a different world where entitlement doesn't seem to address what we need to do in the rich world. Am I entitled to a low-impact food system? Whoa, what a complicated question I've just asked. I don't think entitlement captures that. Do we need it? Yes. The problem is we don't want it. And in Western philosophy, indeed Eastern philosophies, that distinction between wants and needs is once again a really important tradition of thinking to tap into. Do I want a better food system? Yes. Do I need it? Yes, but I don't think I know it. That's where most food politics is at the moment. And that's what we've got to change. That's the challenge, actually. How to translate the needs that the indicators say we've got to deliver on into wants. Yet the entire second half of the 20th century unleashed a fantasy in food. A fantasy world. You can eat what you like, all the time, when you like, doesn't matter how it got to you, how much it costs, it's all getting cheaper and more plentiful. How much choice do we need? One of the biggest 
not myths, but uh, fantasies that we consumers have, a model, an image of us as consumers, is that consumers as choosers. It's the most powerful, successful model that after the Second World War was offered, a better world would be one of more choice. And the neoliberal renaissance in macroeconomics, in political economy, won the arguments on that basis, that it appeals to consumer choice. But all the evidence is that now that's the problem. How many food items do I need when I go shopping? 35,000? People don't even know the price of a hundred, let alone 35,000. There's too much choice at one level. Uh, and it's not the ingredients for a good diet. Actually, simplicity and diversity doesn't need 35,000 items. A different set of criteria come into play. I think we're in the beyond choice cultural world now. I've worked for many, many years with many colleagues around the world on what we call sustainable diets. Mm. What's a sustainable diet? One that's good for health, good for the environment, good socially, ethically, morally, financially, you know. It's a, a complicated matrix, a complicated set of criteria start to emerge from the fog of those two words, sustainable diet. And that one level makes it all seem too difficult. Do I trade off ethics, animal welfare with public health? Do I trade off or abandon morality for, for price? Consumers make decisions very fast, in nanoseconds, mainly based upon norms and habits, but also on marketing. So when one asks about who are the change makers, you need to say, well, Western food culture has changed remarkably fast. If you think biology was laid down for 500,000 years ago, settled agriculture 100,000 years ago, the industrial agricultural revolution maybe 200 years ago, and in the last 50 years, the world's gone through or is still going through a nutrition transition. And it's getting fat because of that. Uh, so we've changed it. And the drivers of that have partly been us, aspiring, partly been amazing success of technical innovation, and partly disastrous, we now know, choices, public policy choices, to throw energy into agriculture, to basically replace human and animal labor with fossil fuels, fertilizers, equipment. Agriculture is energy negative. This is a crazy world. And we rich consumers go to work in cars, or by public transport, using energy, then eat ourselves and say, oh, we must go to the gym and sit on a treadmill. This is crazy. It's metabolic nonsense. So who are the change makers? It's systems change that's needed. There's no one change maker. Business always looks for change makers. Actually, I'm one of those who says it's a systemic crisis. So we have to have systems change. And that needs multiple points of entry. We've got to simplify this systems analysis. And we proposed four levels at which one thinks about change. One is about the material world, the world of physicality, resources. One is the biological world. We humans, my body, your body, our viewers' bodies, are part of the biosphere. One is, thirdly, culture, our aspirations, our cognition, you're thinking, I'm thinking, viewers are thinking as they're watching and listening. And one is social. The fourth level is social. How do we structure our societies? And Jeff Rainer's and my argument in Ecological Public Health, our book, was that to simplify the complexity of systems change, we can use those four measures, material, biophysiological, social and cultural, 
and you won't get change unless you're addressing all those four levels. So when you need change makers, you've got to have change makers in supply chains, in government, in civil society, across those four levels. If you really want to tackle obesity, just build that matrix and say, what can we do in those 12 squares? People ask me, what innovation would you like? Uh, I want multiple innovations. Some we don't need innovations at all and make life better. For the West to eat simpler diets, more plant-based diets, would be a huge change that would be for the good. Is that an innovation? I'm not sure. Yes, culturally it is. But there's one innovation that I find myself getting out of bed for, and that's to try and get onto the public policy agenda the notion of sustainable diets and that we translate that into sustainable dietary guidelines. Because the norms, the habits, the everyday rules for eating have gone haywire. They've gone wrong. They're distorted. They're part of the mismatch between humans, food supply and the planet. And they've caused ecological damage, ecosystems destruction and also public health damage. So it's very serious. And I think to try and sort out what is a sustainable diet, is it the same in Sweden as it is in London, in Malawi? Is it the same in rich societies or a rich household in Stockholm or in a poor household in Stockholm? We need to address around that theme. I want innovation and creativity around sustainable diets.